So here's the uh, required picture scan, I guess. I was, I was told we have to do that and then get five bucks for that. And this is, uh, you know, as I mentioned here, really a consumer's view. Uh, and so I'll try and introduce how scanning probes work to give you an idea of what might be possible. And I really phrase it that way because it remains a wide open field, uh, what we can develop, how we can fuse uh, information from different modalities that can be acquired simultaneously. And I think there's a lot more flexibility uh, in that you know, we direct a probe in real space compared to, for instance, uh, the electron microscopy we've been hearing a lot about uh, throughout. Okay, and we did have a Keck Center that really launched this stuff uh, where we worked with uh, Andrea and Stan and also with a, a neuroimaging uh, colleague, uh, Mark Cohen. So a lot of this uh, was first the motivation for and then the result of uh, that Keck Center. And to you know, give away one a punchline we have, uh, we were able to get atomically resolved structures of amyloid forming peptides without averaging. Okay, and the first time we did that, it took us two years. And after two years of support and working with Andrea, Stan, and their teams, we got it down to 10 minutes. So it's about a factor of 100,000 acceleration, which is what the Human Genome Project did in terms of sequencing, just with our three groups working together. And we have not gone as far as we might. And so at the end, I'll show you what I think are some opportunities. And we have some terrific people coming, especially in workshop four. Just to put out an ad there. Okay. So make sure you come back to that one. Yeah. All right. So uh, what do we do with the uh, STM? Uh, these are the inventors, the late Heine Rohr, here having a beer at 7 in the morning at Hot Springs, because you can do that after you get your Nobel Prize and you're not working in the lab anymore. And Gert Binnig, who got it kind of young and went a little crazy. And then Christoph Gerber, who didn't get the Nobel Prize, but continued on to invent the atomic force microscope with Gert when they visited Cal Quate uh, up at Stanford. And so, you know, early on we realized that we could get atomically resolved structures, but we're not directly mapping the sizes of atoms. And I'll talk about that specifically for someone who has at least, you know, superposition of states, but some chemistry background, it turns out you get more and interesting data out of the images that we record. And, you know, there were some surprises along the way that I'll share. Uh, the single xenon atom that I recorded back when I was uh, Don Eigler's uh, first postdoc at IBM. Uh, we learned to move atoms around. I didn't spell anything, but I was the first one to do it. Later on, he made this quantum corral that's quite famous. And we'll talk about these interference patterns. And, you know, basically these correspond to something like potentials for atoms or parts of molecules on the surface. And one thing I would love to do as a long-term goal is get a transformation from spectroscopic images like that over into potentials that are felt. And then Erhard Schweitzer, who uh, was my office mate and followed me uh, working with Don, figured out how to push atoms and he made this Newton's cradle. It's never been published, so I like to show it. And he got in a coma and left science ultimately. Uh, but he was able to push atoms, so he had these xenon atoms lined up with one off the end, then he shoved this one in to that one, which at that one, which at that one, which at that one, which bounced that one off the end. And there's a reason you would want to do this, it turns out, but they never published it, so. Okay. Uh, to me, this is the most important STM image ever recorded. And it's actually two images that are superimposed. And the idea here was that on this gallium arsenide 110 surface, I teach freshman chemistry, so bear with me. You'll recall that arsenic is to the right of gallium on the periodic table, and thus more electronegative. So on this surface, we have equal numbers of gallium and arsenic atoms. There's charge transfer from the gallium to the arsenic. So the filled orbitals sit on the arsenic, and the empty orbitals sit on the gallium. And from Pauli exclusion principle, right, you can't send any more electrons into the filled orbitals. And so when you have electrons tunneling from the probe tip to the surface, they can only go in empty orbitals. So then they only image the gallium atoms, which I color coded here so I'd remember which are which, these guys. And then when you have electrons tunneling the other way, which you arrange just by flipping the voltage switch to right, flip the polarity of the bias, then you only image the filled states, which are only on the arsenic atoms. And the structure of this was known better before these images were recorded, but as you know, the chemistry part of me saw this, it was like we were putting on goggles and looking at the surface the way an atom 
would see it moving across it. So we have this idea of electrophilic atoms or parts of molecules. That means they go where they're filled orbitals. And nucleophilic it means they go where they're empty orbitals. It turns out to be a little more complicated than that, as I'll show you. But it gives us direct insight and direct imaging into what some you know, uh, atomic or molecular feature would sense as it crossed the surface and then where it would sit. And so that was super exciting. So here's the basic idea of how the microscope works. We bring a needle up within about one atomic diameter of the surface. And it turns out there's pretty much always one lead atom on a sufficiently flat surface. The current varies an order of magnitude per angstrom. And remember, the size of metal atoms is about three angstroms. So from one atom to one further back, that's a factor of 1,000 in current. And so we have this incredible sensitivity that we can use for feedback as we go across the surface. So remember, the tip you know, is also made out of atoms. So if this is the lead atom, right? then when I'm over you, then I'm going to be you know, this far from the surface. But to get the same current between two atoms, and actually tried to do this with a whole bunch of guys named Adam, across the front row of a clock once. I only got one, but he ended up coming and joining my group. So uh, <laughs> then it would have to be a little closer when it's between atoms, then up again. And you know, you two may be different elements, it turns out. And so the extent of your electron orbitals at that particular energy would determine how high the tip has to go. And so we record that because we're both scanning across the surface with these piezoelectric materials, and we can control their position to something like a thousandth of an angstrom, way better than atomic resolution. Not that we find anything smaller. It's just that's what you get when you build this microscope with your own hands, as pretty much all these folks in the second row are doing right now. Uh, I mean, not right now, but earlier. Yeah. The tip Yeah, yeah. It's physically scanned. Okay. Right. And so you choose the gain here uh, to, of the piezo to see how big an area you want to measure versus how high resolution you want. And then, uh, the combination of, of the voltages lets you move the tip in and out. And so you just record that. And that maps the, in the way that we most commonly do it, it maps what's essentially a constant local density of states of the electrons. And then if you're sensitive and stable enough, you might be able to do that over five orders of magnitude of density of states or current. <laughs> Feedback loop that keeps the tip at the right distance. Yeah. Like, what's the actual rate typically? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, depends very much on the microscope and what you're trying to do with it. Uh, in ours, about the fastest we could record a pixel would be about a millisecond. We might go a little more slowly if we're trying to do more. And one of the things that you'll see is we're often recording multiple signals all at the same time. So one of the things we like to do is div of the tip in and out a fraction of an angstrom and record derivative of current with respect to separation. And that gives you some idea of the energy barrier height that then varies according to where the electrons are in a system. And that molecular systems, that turns out to be really valuable. And it allows you to probe beneath the surface. Because you know, uh, oftentimes, let's say you have a molecular layer, you want to know what's going on with, for instance, a buried bond might be a contact. Excellent questions. Keep, keep throwing them at me. Yeah, and so you know, the first time this was done, it was with a strip chart recorder, which. Someone had a question? Oh, yeah. How does it thickness of the sample that it can make the level of thickness? What's the biggest? Largest the thickness. A thickness? Yeah. Well, if it's a metal, as thick as you want. <laughs> yeah, sample could be a metal and then doesn't matter. But if a uh, molecular system, uh, the answer is it depends. And I'll show you an example where we image insulators with a related technique that we invented. Oh, Z. Oh, yeah. So uh, you can, we can go down to uh, femtoamps effectively, uh, fractions of picoamps, then up to about a microamp. So, uh, and for vacuum and metals, that corresponds to you know one angstrom per order of magnitude uh, current. So six, six orders of magnitude approximately with any particular instrument. That's pretty good. Yeah. OK, so here's energy level diagram. Oh, something's not showing up right. 
Yeah, the shading, sorry, doesn't work so well. Okay, so imagine these are all filled states. How about that? Oh, you can sort of barely see. We'll have to make something darker. Okay, so these are all filled states, and these are all filled states. This offset is the bias voltage times the charge on the electron, which in energy units is conveniently electron volts. Okay, so since I can scan that, then I can scan the energy from milli electron volts or lower. Don't help that much, but I will warn you, I do teach freshmen, as I said, and I throw things at people who fall asleep. And so Stan knew that and left because he didn't want to fall asleep. But and I've even hit some in the back row of a class of 400. I never tried it again. It was a really steep incline, too. I never tried it again. With chalk. With chalk, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it became like part of the university tour for a while. So anyway, uh, since we can sweep this voltage very easily, I'm someone who came from optical spectroscopy, where I used to have to change carcinogenic laser dyes, you know, just to get over part of the visible. We can cover the you know, infrared equivalent, or even lower, all the way through the near-infrared, visible, and near-ultraviolet equivalent in energy, limited by what the ionization energy of the materials is, which you know, uh, Laughlin's rule is 5 eV plus or minus 1 for anything that doesn't contain an alkali. So you, know, you can go over several volts spectroscopy just very easily by, by sweeping that. And Paul's colleague, uh, Bob Hamers, was one of the first ones to do that back when he was at IBM. Okay, And then you can choose to image, as you'll see, at different uh, bias voltages, probing different energy orbitals. And you get very dramatically different information in that case. On the other hand, the orbitals are quite broad because they're perturbed on the surface. So one of the things I did my last four days at IBM was I put xenon down on the surface because it's my favorite rear gas and because my mentor had a dog named Xenon. And anyway, so, uh, and what you can see from this image, and these are often, you know, greatly expanded in the vertical is, whereas we know the size of a Xenon atom is about four and a half angstroms from, you know, the spacing in a crystal or the, the diatomic uh, spacing in a gas phase molecule, this atom appears about one and a half angstroms high under these conditions and much broader. And that's pretty typical of STM. And then the question is why it looks like that. And so we worked with uh, Norton Lang, and he showed basically the S orbitals. If you go to the very back of your freshman chemistry book, it's something I make all my students do on the first day. You can look at the extent of orbitals. So the S orbitals are much bigger than the P orbitals, which are much bigger than the D, which are much bigger than the F. And if you look at, for instance, conductivity in metals, right, they have to be pretty closely packed together to get those higher angular momentum orbitals to be you know, interacting or sticking out of the surface and playing a role in the chemistry. And so it turns out the 6s orbital is responsible for everything. Even though it's way up here, the tail of the 6s orbital is what overlaps where we actually measure uh, in these cases. And so that's what you're measuring with, with xenon. And we did actually measure helium on the surface once when we had a leak in the chamber. And indeed, it does. we never published that either. But it appears as a depression just because those orbitals are so far away in energy, right, 1s versus 2s, that there is no contribution from them, but they repel the underlying metal electrons. And so helium shows up as a depression. And some things show up as depressions, and some things show up as protrusions. OK. And so you can use context, for instance. Maybe better to turn the lights back on a little bit, just so. I don't want to hurt anybody. No one has their safety goggles on or anything. So, uh, you can use context and you know some intuition and combinations of other surface science techniques. Uh, maybe not those. Yeah. Okay. We need TFT over here to work out the lighting for us. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. We'll just keep changing them. You know that psychology experiment? There was a lecture that where they just kept increasing the lights, and they realized the brighter the lights were, then the more people paid attention. And then they started decreasing the lights, and people paid more attention. So it turned out just changing things helps. So, thank you, John. <laughs> so uh, based on you know, what we knew from, uh, from uh, you know, other measurements, we could basically identify, oh, this is a row of hydrogen atoms. This sulfur atom looks kind of like this sombrero, and will terminate 
you know, one of the hydrogen rows. And so, you know, you can start to pick things apart. There's a fantastic uh, guy in Austria who looked at alloy surfaces, Peter Fargo, who's since passed away, unfortunately, who was able to identify, you know, a bunch of different metal atoms that were distributed in these uh, random alloys. So uh, here's a kind of fun example. So this is a three-atom nickel cluster sitting on molybdenum disulfide. And this actually is a system that matters because it's used to remove sulfur from molecules in oil refining. So you probably know the environmental restrictions get tighter and tighter and tighter, how much sulfur you can have in diesel and gasoline. And there are all kinds of weird things about this uh, this uh, system. So you use nickel on molybdenum disulfide, and that promotes the reaction, but it doesn't really matter how much of the you know, uh, edges of the molybdenum disulfide you have compared to the nickel for the reactivity. There are all kinds of puzzles that came with it. So we decided to look at these uh, spectroscopically, and we discovered that if we looked at the empty states, so right, 2 EV above the Fermi level, which is how you would capture sulfur, right? Because it has uh, two lone pairs of electrons like oxygen, it's right, blocks in the periodic table. Uh, that would do a good job of capturing it. If you look even a little lower, though, it's almost like the cluster is not there. These are all of the same cluster. And then if you look at the filled states, it's actually, which would repel the sulfur, it's actually depleted compared to the bare surface. And so there are funny electronic effects that are directly related uh, to the chemistry. OK. And then what I actually went to IBM to do and spent the first 13 years of my career working on, and a few months before we succeeded, Wilson Ho was then at Cornell, and now at Irvine succeeded. And then it turned out to be not very useful after we spent like millions of dollars on building laboratories with our own foundation, you know, just like your super you know, electron microscopes, we have our own foundation inside our own building and a room, we control room from the outside. And we've even published papers on, you know, how to construct that and how to put cables in and on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The microscope itself, we just build with our fingers. You sound like my first dean who said, you need all this money and you're telling me this thing's only an inch and you glue it together yourself. And it's like, what the hell is going on? No. So, yeah. So we dug, you know, eight feet down in the foundation and we, we filled it back with a, you know, floating concrete slab and then we built an acoustic isolation building around it. And then around our extreme high vacuum chamber, we have a helium chamber because helium gives good thermal coupling, but poor acoustic coupling. And then a liquid helium doer that can hold 10 days worth of helium. And then all the surface science equipment and UHV and the transfer lines and everything else. And by the time you're done, the first one we built was probably eh, just the microscope itself, maybe 750,000. I got 300,000 startup. And then the room, I never asked. But I know when we looked at building one in Young Hall, it was at least two million to get started. So, yeah, after me, the startup started getting a lot better. For all my academic, much more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The microscope itself, you know, you can build a whole pile of them. The piezos are, right? Zishi just, well, they're 100, 200 bucks, and you have four of them. Yeah, and as you know, one of my uh, early postdocs said, well, let's use gold. Gold is cheap. No, <laughs> you know, sort of that that level. Yeah. The, yeah, AFM was on a Mars rover. Uh, we'll talk about AFM. It's a little more general, as you'll see. It doesn't require a conducting substrate. So in the early days, uh, IBM and Bell Labs owned this whole field, and all they studied was semiconductors. And then and the invention was at IBM Zurich. And then in academics, it was, people looked at metals, but they're really looking at like corrosion and catalysis, which I'm not much of a chemist. You'll probably figure out. That wasn't very interesting to me. And so we tried to develop spectroscopic tools for insulators. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that. And that costs something just because you know, every, every microwave box is you know, 100, 200,000 bucks. And you need a pile of them. Yeah. But it isn't like you know, a zillion dollars. Oh, people have spent like 30 million, I think, is about the most. Anyone spent an STM. Uh, Seamus Davis has like a whole building, and he'll spend three months, you know, recording one image uh, spectroscopically across a, you know, disco surface. But that's like super specialty. 
Yeah, and then yeah, helium, I mean, it was, we were spending 1,000 a week on helium. Uh, now it would be, if you could get helium, it would probably be 5,000 a week. So operating expenses can be pretty high if you're doing low temperature work. Yeah, so what we were trying to do was, it turns out if you go back to this energy level diagram, electrons are tunneling elastically across this barrier, which is due to the ionization, of, you know, the work function of the sample on the tip. Uh, but you can have inelastic scattering in which you excite, for instance, a molecular vibration. And since that opens up a new channel, you expect a little bit more current. And that, that current can be mimicked by the, we predicted, by the motion of the tip of about a thousandth of an angstrom. So you have to, that's why you make everything super stable and you get rid of the effect of the boiling helium and everything. And so we did all kinds of experiments. We actually probably saw it back in 1988. But what we didn't see, we were looking at my favorite class A carcinogen, benzene, so C686. But when we looked at C6D6, there was no signal. And it turns out that, you know, so here's acetylene. And Wilson Ho, to his credit, looked at about 20 different molecules before he found one that had the isotope shift you'd expect. Because when you put the heavier hydrogen on, right, you lower the vibrational frequency. Uh, and so, you know, he could image the uh, normal acetylene and produderated acetylene. But it turns out the problem with the spectroscopy and why it's relatively useless is we don't understand the phase relationship to this day of the elastic scattering versus inelastic scattering. So they could be in phase and the signals would go the same way. They could be out of phase, in which case that vibrational signal goes down. But frequently they seem to be orthogonal, in which case there's no inelastic signal. And so if you're trying to do spectroscopy, and number one, you don't know the selection rules, and number two, you don't know if the signal goes up, down, or doesn't appear, not a very useful spectroscopy. So Chris here is trying to build a, uh, an infrared version of that that doesn't require room temperature, that doesn't require low temperatures. And we'll see. We have a little teeny bit of data that I'm not going to show. OK. We did something further, and that is, you know, one of the interesting things is what's the interaction of the molecule with the surface? There's also a vibration there, but those are very low frequencies. And so we were able to do that, again, for my favorite class A carcinogen, uh, benzene on the silver surface, looking at different sites and seeing how strongly, you know, the, the spring constant is a measure of the bonding strength. And so we're able to see different spring constants for different molecules. And then back to the you know, what the heck are you looking at question. Uh, one of the things I did in, you know, the earliest days was to put a benzene molecule, just decorate a platinum one-on-one -on -one surface very lightly uh, with it. And then I showed there were three different adsorption sites which led to three different images under identical conditions. And that was, you know, threefold hollow versus a, over a single ad atom versus straddling two. And then Philippe Sauté, who was then in Lyon, and uh, now is at UCLA, did a calculation. I think this might have even been his thesis uh, that, that you know, said we got the uh, assignment correct. And then for many years, he would visit Berkeley every year. It was like an unfair advantage to the group at Berkeley doing STM. And then about six years ago, seven years ago, because it was right after the second to last Pacific Chem, he moved to UCLA. And now it's an unfair advantage for us. So. I'm fine with that. OK. Then what we discovered was that around these molecules, if we looked at quite a big distance compared to chemistry. So to give you an idea of chemical distances, if you go from a carbon, carbon, single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, you're only changing the spacing by about a tenth of an angstrom each. Okay. And so here are images that are 15 angstroms by 15 angstroms. And you look at some distance from the molecule, and you see a depleted density of states there. And so at this particular energy, right, if you were a molecule that liked, say, another reactant, that liked uh, state density at that energy, you'd come in along these axes more favorably. And if you didn't, you'd come in along these axes. Now, benzene's symmetric, so it wouldn't make any difference. But for other molecules we've shown, that does actually make a difference. So when you take a benzene that's missing one hydrogen, it attaches to the surface in a reaction that's been known for 100 years. What wasn't known was we were able to show that those two, they're called phenyl radicals, aligned in front of each other because each one of them perturbs the electronic structure for the other. So you get this kind of butterfly where 
as it's flapping its wings, it's trying to enter the reaction coordinate. And so you get much higher efficiency in terms of catalysis with the surface than you would if they were just roaming around on the surface. You kind of made a pit for them to come together with the right orientation for reaction. And so we were able to discover that through studies like these. OK. Oh, shoot. This doesn't show up very well. OK. So uh, maybe you know this picture, but there are these ripples like this in the surface that are from electrons scattering off the step edges. So uh, on this copper one-on-one -on -one surface and many others, there are surface states, so electronic states that are confined to the surface and near surface. And if you terminate with a one atomized step, which is what that is, then there's an interference pattern where the electrons scatter off the step. And it's a stronger effect when you go step down than when you go step up because, you know, when you go step up, there's still atoms there. Okay? And so there was an argument over, a couple arguments over this. The, the less funny one was there was a group at IBM Yorktown who saw this a year before Eigler did, and they kept trying to publish it in PRL, and the referees and editors just gave them a hard time. How is this real? This can't be. And then Don's paper came on the cover Nature, and Faven sent it in to PRL said, see, it is right. <laughs> anyway. But the argument from both those groups was there was only electrons launched by the tip that were reflecting back to the tip, and that was the interference patterns. And we said they've got to, those interference patterns have to be there all the time. And we have the advantage that they're dispersive. In other words, as you change the energy, the wavelength changes. And so different states are enhanced at different relative positions. So we took a cue from what people do in superconductivity with labeling vortices, and we decorated molecules. You might be able to guess which class A carcin gen we used to do this, since benzene's nucleophilic. We decorated step edges and showed that they went into the proper peaks for the energy of the electron orbitals that the benzene liked. And so we were able to show that even if the STM's not there, those interference patterns are there, and that has consequences. And we've been able to show that even up to like 600K, those effects can, uh, uh, can determine the placement of atoms on surfaces. So even at sort of under catalytic conditions, one might care about. And you can you know, play little games like having these mazes. These aren't extra atoms or anything. Those are just the interference patterns of the electrons. And I think this won one of those MRS competitions. That would be the first no, no, the first one was, uh, what's their names with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bell Labs when the nickel crystal uh, melted. Yes, Davidson Germer, thank you very much. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, they accidentally left their power supply on. They melted this, this uh, nickel lump and then it crystallized when it cooled. And then when they showed electrons through, they got to fraction. And then I guess Davidson hopped on a boat and went to Rutherford and, Germer went from technician to professor at Cornell. I grew up there, so I got to meet him at least. But yeah, yep. Uh, so no, that was known. And in fact, you know, these wavelengths were known too. That was not new. What was new to was observe their spatial, uh, you know, spatial resolution. And then we've used those uh, to to say, okay, well, these are going to affect uh, the chemistry. So this is a much bigger terrorist than you know. It looks like a you know billiard setup, uh, but in fact you know they're in 130 angstroms. What's that? About 40 atoms across there, so it's just electron interferences. And you can do that even with missing atoms. So Kevin Kelly, who's going to come, uh, was a graduate student at the time at Rice University with Naomi Hallis, the only STM student she ever had in her group. And it's an ONR contractors meeting I went to. Uh, she showed uh, these data where they picked up a C60 a molecule on the tip of an STM and showed this interference pattern as if they had higher uh, spectral resolution. So normally, right, you get smearing due to the Fermi, uh, uh, Fermi level at a finite temperature, or Fermi energy uh, distribution at finite temperature, but they seem to have a filter to make, uh, to get higher spectral resolution. So Naomi, gave her talk, came over to me and said, what do you think of that? And I said, well, I think it's wrong. 
And so I said, well, how do you test it? I said, well, let's go to low temperature and see if we see the same thing with a normal tip. So I said, when can you do that? And I said, ah, two weeks. And so she flew Kevin up, and we actually set up the experiment while he was en route. We had the data by the time he landed, and then he still hassles me that there was an abstract due at midnight. So we got an abstract submitted. I think it was AVS, and we went out to a bar, and he never got dinner. So I still owe him dinner after all these years. He later postdoctored with me. He was chief scientist of a spin out company at a lab. And now he'll come and speak in uh, workshop four. Uh, and he's done, I think, two sabbaticals here as well. So in any case, if you're missing an atom, you've got these you know, long range uh, uh, anisotropic uh, structures. And we see that in things like graphene, where you can put a dopant atom or have a vacancy that then uh, those can interact and have spin effects and so forth. And so Don later did this quantum corral. What intrigued me about this was, here's this constructive interference, no extra atom there. If I put a molecule in place, you know, in this cage, if you will, uh, that likes electrons at that energy and it's mobile, it should go right to the middle. And then uh, one of my academic brothers, uh, uh, not Vinnie Minor and his brother, the one at Stanford. Anyway, uh, they made these sort of drum effects. They would, you know, make structures on the surface which, as a function of energy, would change in a different, it was kind of neat. Not very useful, but neat. Okay, so then, you know, back to your question, what can you study? So, uh, when I started my independent career, the semiconductors were owned by IBM and Bell Labs. There was no point in studying any of those. Even the labs were competing and they had their management negotiating, like who could look at the silicon 110 versus this with silver on it versus something else. It was just, you know, it was getting picked over really fast. The metal work that was done at universities wasn't so interesting to me, but it looked like there were a lot of interesting insulators in the world, including biological systems. And so we said, well, how could we do spectroscopy on those? We're going to talk about atomic force microscopy in a minute. At the time, there was no atomic resolution, and there were no spectroscopic capabilities to AFM. That has since changed. And so we had the idea of being able to dribble electrons back and forth between the tip and sample at frequencies faster than charge dissipation. Actually, uh, Greg Kachansky at Bell Labs had tried to do something like that, and he's the one who figured out that if you use the third harmonic of the current, it has the right parity to control the tip height, but what he didn't do was uh, shield his microwave cables. And so when he first built this thing, it turned into a microwave oven on the first use, and the whole chamber baked, and he got moved first over to displays, and then he quit Bell Labs and became a linguistics professor at Oxford. So out of there. And then we realized that you know, we could shield right up to the, uh, he also had a mechanical cavity to to do impedance matching. And so he would have to, you know, turn a screw basically to do any spectroscopy. That's no way to live when you're trying to, you know, see things with atomic resolution. And so we realized that we could make, uh, you know, we could cable this correctly to be shielded, uh, that we could use the nonlinearities in the system to tell the difference between electronic structural effects, charging effects. Like if you put one electron on a surface, if you want to bring another electron up within a nanometer, that costs you 1.4 EV. It's known as Coulomb blockade. And so we should be able to measure the harmonics to see, okay, what are the thresholds for charging? If there's a dielectric response of a molecule, you should be able to sweep the frequency up and see when the molecule can no longer follow the field. And then what we did was we built a cavity such that within the range that we studied, 0 to 20, 26 gigahertz, right, there were no resonances, there were no anti-resonances. So we got rid of all kinds of standing wave problems. And then we ended up mixing frequencies and also including DC in the case where we had something sufficiently conducting. And we were able to get atomic resolution and we were able to do these spectroscopies with this sort of massive phase space to figure out which is going to come into play a little later when we talk about self cell monolayers. But one of our early images, we were able to record, you know, lead silicate glass uh, and, you know, at these sort of crazy frequencies and, you know, publish some things on insulators. We looked at a virus in the very early days, but we did not realize when we put it on a silicon surface that you also get a voltage dependent capacitance. So this technique turns out to be really useful for measuring dopants because you can match the DC bias to the dopant level, so you can identify it 
energetically, which identifies it chemically, and you can learn something about its depth, in some cases with atomic resolution, as I'll show you. Uh, but uh, because we put the viruses on a silicon wafer and it wasn't that, uh, you know, uh, highly doped, we saw this huge voltage-dependent capacitance, so the images were really terrible. And we, yeah, anyway, never published that either. Just to show you, uh, we include multiple microwave sources, and, you know, prices go up, uh, and then mix those together along with a, a DC, and we typically record them at a small uh, frequency in the kilohertz. And the idea here is that the capacitive signal, right, goes up linearly with frequencies. If you can work at high frequencies, you're screwed because you can't do the, you know, you can't get the orthogonal signal so easily. But there's essentially nothing in the kilohertz. So if you mix two microwave frequencies that are, that are coupled down to a few kilohertz, then you have zero background uh, to a good approximation and you can get all these signals out that you want. And so that works out pretty well. So, you know, just as one example, this is molybdenum disulfide where vacancies function as dopants. And so we can tell how deep they are by how big the signal is. And so, yeah, anyway. And we did this, we were part of the, uh, you know, what's called the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors because nobody had a way to measure dopants at the level at which um, they need, that they were already being uh, placed. Okay, let's switch over to AFM for a little bit. So AFM, instead of the feedback mechanism being current, it's the force between the end of a needle and a surface. So if it's out of contact, then it's an attractive force. But if it's pushing into the surface, then it's a repulsive force. So just think of like a diatomic potential. Are you on the repulsive wall or are you on the attractive part? It's easier to use the repulsive wall, right? because it's steeper, right? It's all about how steep is the potential. So if you're on the repulsive wall, it's really steep, but on the other hand, you're scratching the surface, literally scratching the surface. And you know, uh, you can try going just off the surface. That is much, much harder, but it's been developed in absolutely beautiful ways I'll show you shortly. And then intermediate to that, and pretty common in like run-of-the-mill stuff like you do at CNSI, is tapping mode where you're kind of going da 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 da, da which might annoy the surface, but you can, you know, keep it calm enough that you're not doing a lot of damage if it's not so soft. And then you know people have come up with other modes. And so this is the most beautiful recent non-contact AFM where what one does is pick up uh, typically a carbon monoxide molecule on the tip, and when you do that, it interacts with the electron orbitals of molecules and you're able to map all those bonds. And so you, if you read you know, Science or Nature, these kind of keep coming out. There's a really spectacular paper by Leo Gross. Uh, let's see, when was I in uh, Aarhus? A few, just a few months ago. And we're going to have him give a seminar, if you're interested, in uh, PCAM, uh, showing that they could also you know, induce reactions this way and follow the reaction products. Uh, just, just amazing. So with AFM. Now, one can uh, basically uh, confirm structures is probably the right way to put it. This is, yeah, I think this is CO on CO. Uh, and there's, there are signatures of the, the molecule on the end isn't stable, like tilts over. And so you see some structure in that. Also, if you do go over to some other adsorbate, with a normal tip, you see nothing like this. You, you pick up a molecule in place and then go use that. And you can combine this now with uh, STM at the same time. So with STM, you have higher sensitivity. In our, you know, what we used to do in the low temperature microscope where we had the stability is if we would, you know, we would make sure that the lead atom really stuck out a lot further by measuring step edges in different directions. So if you see a step that's you know, two-thirds of an atom and then one-third of an atom. It's not new physics. It's you have an atom that's contributing to the tunneling that's not the front one. And so it's pretty easy to knock that one off and just have one, you know, have a sharp enough tip for your particular experiments. And so here what you do is you find a molecule on the surface and then you dip into it slowly till you lift it off the surface. It's not there anymore. And we actually did that in very early days. I picked up benzene, of course, you know, and then, you know, put it down on the surface somewhere just so we could do it. 
but we didn't typically image with it. And then uh, first, uh, so uh, Franz Giesebel, a long time ago, got the first atomic resolution with an AFM. And it was just like part of one image back when he was working with Gert Binnig and everyone scratched their heads like, how do you do that? You know? And then he didn't know. And so it was years and years, 20, 30 years, right before it became a routine thing. And this uh, Gert Meyer was at um, uh, Berlin, Free University of Berlin, I think. Uh, he, had, he had kind of perfected the liftoff uh, part. And then uh, Giesebel made this tuning fork it's called Q+, if you want to look it up, uh, that lets you do this kind of imaging with the, with the molecularly functionalized tip. Yeah. How are we doing on time? Okay. And then, you know, there are lots of other modes. So, uh, you know, you can measure charge on the surface. That was developed by Rugar and Maiman. You can measure magnetic force. That was developed by Rugar and Maiman, both at IBM Almaden. Uh, they tried to do basically uh, electron spin resonance and, and nuclear magnetic resonance with this magnetic force resonance microscopy, which was invented by an orthopedic surgeon in Seattle, but developed by Maiman and Rugar. Uh, and when they first started, they were like 20 orders of magnitude off in sensitivity, and like steadily marched year by year. It's, you can imagine if you're at a university trying to get funding to do this, right? Uh, and they'd you know, get about an order of magnitude every year, and hopefully they'll get all the way there before they retire. Uh, you can do Raman spectroscopy by sending light on the tip, and you get this antenna enhancement. Uh, we do this photon absorption. We used to do this photon emission. A bunch of groups do uh, spin polarized STM. I talked a little bit about the microwaves. OK, so when we first developed the microwaves, we were trying to figure out what we could do with them. And we tried to look at as broad a range of samples as possible. So Dave Alara, shown here unhappy at his 80th birthday celebration, uh, had developed with Ralph Nuzzo, uh, right here, when they were Bell Labs, these alkane thialon gold monolayers that, familiar, not familiar? Not familiar, okay. So you can take a sulfur-containing molecule and dip a gold surface in it or evaporate those molecules on it or even with a rubber stamp, put them on the surface, and they'll form a one molecule thick layer that orders in two dimensions and completely changes the properties of the surface. So since the exposed chemistry determines the chemical, physical, and biological properties, you can put whatever you want on the ends here and do that. And so Dave and Ralph just won the Cavalry Prize for that last week, and Dave couldn't go, so I got the medal from the king. Uh, they won it with George Whitesides, who took this and ran with it for all kinds of chemical patterning. And our contribution is really bringing it down to single molecule control and fraction of a molecule even placement to control that chemical functionality. No Cavalry Prize for me. OK, so uh, we, uh, what Dave said is, well, since you can do a spectroscopy with microwaves, why don't we put two different molecules down on the surface at the same time and you can tell them apart. Because at the time, it was thought the molecules went down randomly and were irreversibly and were mobile on the surface once they got there. We knew about this 30 degree tilt for these saturated chains and so forth. But to our surprise, even with before we turn the microwaves on, we tell them apart. And they phase separated, which had been not just not expected. Uh, Whitesides had published a paper with John Deutsch. And since we might want to use the recording, I won't say what I sometimes do, but it was his last scientific paper saying you could never get phase separation in monolayers. If I turn the mic off, I can say whatever I want, all right? Hold on. Ah, we'll tell you later. Ask after we... Oopsie, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, what's going on? Okay, so uh, we saw phase separation, and that led to all the kind of chemical patterning that we've developed since. And we learned to isolate even individual molecules and the, each one of these protrusions is a single molecule. We could identify the kinds of defects, and we learned to control the type and density of defect such that we could isolate single molecules, pairs of molecules, which I'm going to show you, lines of molecules or clusters. Okay? And then we could study the function and spectrum and structure of single ones or pairs and so forth. And so, for instance, these three ring conjugated molecules, sometimes called Tour molecules, oligophenylene thionylenes, that's Jim Tour. He used to be at South Carolina, we had a speaker, but moved to Rice. Uh, 
were, had been discovered to be, you know, quote unquote molecular switches, where Mark, the late Mark Reed at Yale bundled 10,000 of them into a hole in a silicon nitride membrane that was metallized on each side, and you saw hysteretic conductance switching. And so we asked, could single molecules function as switches, and how did they, what was the mechanism? And six groups, actually five groups, had proposed six mechanisms of switching. And so what we did is we tested each mechanism by changing the molecule we studied to include or exclude the proposed mechanism. And we showed that all six were wrong, that single molecules could switch using this isolation strategy. And what actually was responsible for switching was the molecules would tilt, and that would change the hybridization of the buried bond. And so that left us with three questions. How quickly could they move? Slew rate, right? We could stabilize them for hours at room temperature, but how quickly could they change from one state to another? And if you think of a frustrated rotation, that should be in the gigahertz frequency range, conveniently where our microwaves are. Uh, what are the absolute structures? We had some indirect measurements by playing with the hydrogen bonding with a matrix, moving this amide up and down, not in a single molecule, but getting a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, and then uh, the th uh, third question was, what's the conductance of the buried bond? And so we developed new spectroscopies that answered each one of those questions. So for tilt, we figured out that we could measure both the topography, and there had been a fight in the field about what it is you measure in these layers. Is it the exposed surface, the buried interface, the integrated tunneling path? So we showed that if we used combinations of the longer and shorter chains that formed identical structures, that under most conditions, as long as the tip isn't touching the film, they are measuring the exposed surface. And you can see that in the offset and phase of the shorter chains in the field of view of longer ones. And we did lots of different combinations, as I'll show you. And then it turns out we can simultaneously measure the largest buried dipole with that measurement where we modulate the tip sample separation, a fraction of angstrom, and plot out derivative of current with respect to separation, what's called local barrier height. And since all the sulfur gold bonds are in registry, we only get a single lattice. Okay. And then the trick is which top goes with which bottom. And for that, you use the buried domain boundaries, and you get the absolute polar and azimuthal angles. So I was pretty excited because I'd been working for 20 years on how to measure tilts with an STM, and this solved that problem. Then uh, later, you know, you could see it kind of jumps out at you here. Right? Not so hard to assign. But it turns out you can measure more than one buried dipole. So if you add this, what's called an amid, important in peptides, right, that form hydrogen bonds. There are two different conformations of these that we know how to tell apart. And the amide has a dipole too. But when you look at the data, it doesn't jump out the same way at all. So working with Stan and Andrea, and I'll you know, refer you to the paper and some of the stuff we're going to talk about, we could separate not only, OK, where do we have the different structures, but where are the hydrogen bonds when we're disordered? And one surprise we had is those hydrogen bonding networks continue across domain boundaries, right? They actually double the interaction strength between the chains, which are otherwise just van der Waals interactions. And so you kind of seal up the surface even where the tops of the chains are disordered. You have one big hydrogen bonding network. It's kind of cool. And so that actually explains some earlier data. If we took the amide-containing molecules and put them on liquid metal nanoparticles, and then used ultrasound to break the liquid metal nanoparticles apart, we wouldn't get any oxidation. They were passivated with these hydrogen bonding networks. Whereas if we use the ones that don't have the amide bonds, then all the liquid metal would just get oxidized. I once said we got oxidized, you know, oxidized crap or something like that. And in the front row was the NSF program manager for oxide materials who took very great offense at that. <laughs> so I try not to say that anymore. <laughs> okay, what about time scales? Well, if we just go sweeping through, remember you asked, we get about one, one millisecond per pixel at our fastest rate. And you know, one of the beautiful things in terms of sparsity here is all our data are sparse because we're oversampling even individual atoms, right? And so we're recording several pixels and we can tell when, for instance, a molecule switches while we're measuring it because it looks broken. Okay. And so we get some sense of that and the apparent height, which is our proxy for conductance. If it's upright, it turns out it's more conducting. Tilted, it's less conducting. We can get those values. And we're kind of covering the one to, you know, 
100,000 second uh, time scale looking at 50 molecules. If we just sit over one very active switch, then we can see her flipping back and forth, right? And we're limited by the bandwidth of our, in this case, feedback loop because we're going up and down because we're keeping the feedback loop on. If we turn off our feedback loop and just measure current, our bandwidth takes us out to about uh, megahertz, okay? So we've now covered 11 orders of magnitude, but remember I said what we think it's going to be is another four orders of magnitude faster than that. And so the microwaves would be great, except we have this terrible impedance match between 50 ohms and essentially open circuit at the tip. So we can't get enough amplitude in to the tip to drive it back and forth. And at one time we were working on frequency agile impedance matching with Agilent, but that group went poof in one of their, you know, reorganizations. What we can use microwaves for is, I think you probably know about polarizability, right? The longer a chain is, the more polarizable it is. The bigger orbitals are more polarizable. So S is way more polarizable than P, which is more polarizable than D and so forth. And so we can show uh, with the microwaves, how do the electrons respond? We get single molecule resolution, but we're not looking at isolated molecules. We're looking at molecules attached to 10 to the 22 metal atoms. So the extent to which the substrate electrons can go in and out of the molecule on these frequency scales determines, right, how, or tells us, reports back, how open that conductance channel is, the buried bond that's the contact. And so we can look at the same molecule in the on versus the off state and show polarizability changes a factor of two, meaning the contribution from the, mole the molecule's electrons is equal to or less than the contribution from the electrons coming through the substrate molecule bond in the on state. And so now we have a way to measure those buried bonds, and that's exciting. Okay, a uh, little dynamics motivation. So uh, one of the things we did is we went to this uh, gold 111 surface that has three different types of surfaces right next to each other repeating all the time. And we put our favorite molecule, benzene, down, and it's only lightly uh, interacting with the surface so we can also peer right through it and figure out the exact site by measuring the substrate atoms through the molecules. And then we went for 42 hours just recording in the same area because we have this stable microscope that just sits there and I think it'll go here. And we recorded motion. So anytime you see these breakups, that's molecules moving. And then it turns out there are two different kinds of motions. There are single molecule motions and then there are concerted motions. So the concerted ones, I remember, are blue and red. You see like a chain switching across. And then the numbers are how many nearest neighbors they have because through those, that perturbation that you saw in the earlier data, there's an attractive potential that holds the molecule in place. The more nearest neighbors you have, the more stable you are. Are those probing use motions? Excellent question. We can measure that too. So yes, there's a contribution from the probe that's equivalent to about 10 times the temperature. Yeah. So I'll just skip ahead because it just kind of keeps going like that. So we can measure, you know, what is the well depth of each of the positions, but we can also measure what's the, you know, interaction between the molecules to a hundredth of a kilojoule per mole, way better than can be calculated. And then we could also measure the effect of the tip. Right, so we're even better than a hundredth of a kilojoule per mole there. Oh, so for uh, EV people, right, a hundred kilojoules per mole is an EV. So we're measuring, you know, anyway, you get it. Um, so the interaction between the molecules is quite small, but it's actually comparable to the the tip under these particular conditions. And so we go and we measure that. And that's about 10 times the thermal energy that we have in the system. Okay. And so that was a pretty laborious, this was pre, you know, Andrea and Stan times. And that's kind of what drew us together for this Keck Center, yeah. Honestly. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll cover this part and then I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit. All right. So, and it's great having the question. So, you know, actually the first time anyone ever measured the conductance of an individual molecule was uh, this uh, data set. So what we did is we used combinations of longer and shorter chains and identical structures, and we compared the physical height difference that we knew 
with the measured apparent height difference. Okay? And at the time it was thought there might be cooperative effects. There turned out not to be. But what we did is we arranged the molecules so we had domains of one, domains of the other, and then inclusions of each one and the other to compare. And you can see that apparent height is about the same as that apparent height difference. And then we did lots of different combinations and we showed, okay, you know, this region where you increase the current, that's actually where you run into the film and you lose molecular resolution. And if you extrapolate all the way down to zero chain length, you get the contact conductance. And at the time, people talked about what, if I gave you a material, you should be able to tell me what molecule best connects to it. It was called molecular alligator clip. Turned out to be uh, the incorrect way to think. And one of the arguments was, okay, well, let's switch sulfur for selenium. It's right below sulfur in the periodic table, so it's a little bit bigger. Forms a stronger bond to gold. There's a stable mineral. Uh, and so we used combinations of the sulfur-containing molecules and the selenium-containing molecules. And this is correctly to scale, where the molecule is a little bigger with selenium, but the tip had to go closer, saying that they're less conductive. And there had been calculations saying so the selenium-containing molecules would be five times more conductive, others saying they're five times less conductive, and then calculations in between. So when we went and did all the different combinations, we showed that the selenium is five times less conductive for this backbone. And that's what we discovered looking at the theory was people didn't consider the effect of the backbone in shifting the bands. And so the good news is you can get band alignment by sh shifting the backbone or functionalizing it. The bad news, you tell me the material, I can't just tell you what alligator clip to use. And people have since done other, other materials like isonitriles. I'm going to skip benzene. I mean the uh, graphene. Let's get to something more interesting. Okay. Well, here's a non-contact uh, FM measurement showing that we understood that reaction. And you can functionalize the edges and identify the atoms. And just as we did in those monolayers for things like graphene nanoribbons and other 2D structures, you can shift the bands around in interesting and useful ways, which uh, the Berkeley group, uh, particularly Felix Fisher and UCLA alumnus and my academic brother, Mike Cromie, uh, did where here, for instance, for armchair graphene nanoribbons, as you change the width, you change the band gap. So for semi infinite planes, they're semi metals, no band gap. But as you narrow them, you get higher and higher band gaps. So you can kind of build an inline device this way, if you you know squint and tilt your head sideways, uh, or you can functionalize the graphene nanoribbons on their sides and also get band shifts and make something in this case sort of like a diode. And then Felix Fisher, uh, who's both an organic chemist and an STM guy, is going to be doing a sabbatical with us in 2024, uh, has looked at impurities in graphene nanoribbons. We're doing these kinds of things intentionally where we have interacting spins. And so part of our new uh, Keck Center and then a MURI we just submitted last Friday that hopefully will get funded with uh, all colleagues here, uh, will let us understand how these uh, spins interact. He just sort of accidentally uh, had impurities that he could follow in this case. And he's been really brilliant about looking at these interactions. So he's coming here at least for a year. We'll see if we can steal him. Okay. And we've done things like making tiles of sort of graphene nanoribbons with built-in dopants. Now, these are symmetric so that when we stitch them together, we've defined the pitch and spacing, but you can also put them off center and then have them rotate around and measure a whole bunch of different ones all at the same time. These were uh, the precursors synthesized by Klaus Müller and working with Zhang Feng Duan here and Bill Goddard over at Caltech who was texting all morning. Okay, and carbranes we're not going to talk about, but we can control charge at a surface in this way and yeah, I want to leave some time for questions on the you can make things pretty complex. Okay, let's talk about photons a little bit. So uh, Yang Yang's leading solar energy guy here in uh, at, uh, UCLA's in material science and asked for some help with, with uh, making his transparent solar cells. And then we got interested in, could we pick apart the active part of it and look at when you excite a molecule or a complex where charge goes and figure out how to pull it out efficiently. And people have done uh, synthesis, particularly people like Alex Chen, who was at University of Washington at that time. Now he's at City U Hong Kong. I think he's provost. We were on a panel together last night. Uh, and so uh, Moon Hee Kim, 
had uh, built 30 STMs in our group before she uh, got this one where we could photo excite the molecule that was under the tip without shining light on the tip. So that's pretty tough, right, because they're an atom apart and wavelength of light is big, you know, invisible relatively. And so a trick that we use is we excite evanescently from underneath and we make sure we're not uh, heating, for instance, by looking at whether we see molecules that don't absorb light uh, have any enhanced signal. And so what she was able to do is put in pairs of molecules at a time, starting with a precursor that had both of them in it, and then she could photo excite them to react in a way that they wouldn't do in solution. In solution, they would rotate around and those two carbons would react with these triple bonds, but since we were holding them in place, kind of like an enzyme is the way we sold it, even though it was just kind of a tune-up experiment, we could show that we got a different reaction product uh, than one got in solution. And she could show that with a structure, with them tilting or not tilting according to whether they're tethered together and spectroscopically, before reaction, under illumination, and then after reaction. So it's pretty cool. And then we went to the, okay, well, let's look at molecules that have built-in donor acceptors. So these are Alex Jen's uh, triad molecules. And uh, Shen Kei Wang looked at these. It turns out while when you draw the structure, they look symmetric. On the surface, they're not. One of the fullerenes goes up and one goes down. There's an obvious spectroscopic difference that we can image within the molecules. Again, we excite from underneath. And we can see the charge redistribution within these molecules while we're photo exciting them. It's kind of cool. Okay. Now, let's, uh, I think what I'll finish up is some work on uh, biomolecules where, you know, I argue that averaging is bad. So for biomolecular structures, you know, Hong showed these, you know, beautiful structures before that still took a few thousand, you know, viruses to measure. And so there's some averaging built into those. If you do crystallography, you have to make a crystal. And we heard several times about how horrific that is. My brother's a crystallographer. It's not where he was. He got his degree over here. No way to live. He actually worked with True Blood, who the lecture halls were named after. And it's still a specialty in the department. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, the other uh, approach is NMR, which requires so many molecules, again, that's averaging. And so we, we're interested in heterogeneity and uh, variations. And, you know, one, one way we like to uh, describe that is when Watson and Crick stole Rosalind Franklin's data and assigned the double helix structure, they didn't get the sequence, right, that took the advances from Lee Hood and others uh, in order to see how our uh, genomes are different one to the next and one species to the next and so forth. And so we want to be able to do that. So Chen Wang, who was then head of the Beijing Nano Center, it's an STM guy, had looked at these amyloid forming peptides and he was able to, uh, with STM, he was able to show where they folded. And he said, well, look, in the microwaves, it turns out we're sensitive to a bunch of things. We're sensitive to multiple bonds and Amino acids have those. We're sensitive to points of contact. It turns out kind of light up in the microwave difference fre frequency signal. So wherever a substrate is in contact or where there's molecule-molecule contact, we'll be able to observe that. And then we're able to look at dipoles like the amides. And so by combining different modalities, we should be able to get atomically resolved structures. And so we started working together, and this was led by Shelley Claridge, who was a postdoc at the time. Now she's a professor at Purdue, and she won one of those Schmidt polymath fellowships to two and a half million bucks to learn something new and do whatever she wants. She wants to come back. We're delighted. Uh, and so she'll be here uh, this coming uh, winter and spring. So what she did is she combined the STM images the mic, this isn't aliasing. This is where the molecules are coming into contact with the surface. And so we build up these puzzle pieces into an overall structure in combination with modeling. And the first time we did that, it took two years. And we got an atomically resolved structure, and we didn't learn anything. That's where it goes. And then, working with Stan and Andrea and their teams, uh, we built out this you know, segmentation strategy where once we had the different domains isolated, we could go and analyze those automatically. So for instance, we got all the angles of the peptides in all the individuals. One of the difficult things in the early days was to get our mathematician colleagues not to throw out the domain boundaries as artifacts, right? Because for us, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. 
right? There's more information in the edges and the corners as you work in. And so, you know, while, you know, we got this, this sort of head start of, you know, what's in the middle, uh, what's at the edges really uh, told us a lot more. And then uh, Diana Uge, a uh, grad student in the group, started looking at the amyloid uh, that's formed in Alzheimer's, A beta 1 to 42. And it turns out that uh, copper is uh, thought, copper and iron are thought to play roles in the disease. That one hypothesis is that they do catalytic damage to the surroundings and also to the uh, peptides themselves. Uh, but the modeling of all, there's a huge copper toxicity group and there are places in your brain where coppers are concentrated. They just assume that the copper ions were spread like butter over the amyloids, and they're not. And so what Diana went out to do was to get the structure. She started with a shorter sequence because it was, it was known there was some favorable uh, copper uh, interaction with the first 16 peptides. And so she figured out the structure where the copper is sitting between these histidine straddling chains. And that affects where the chains are, as you'll see. And we get that out because we can, oh, this is not a useful one. Yeah. So uh, Jerome Gillis was a postdoc. Uh, here at that time, now he's a professor at San Diego State, sort of worked out how to identify all the different chains. And then he and Diana looked at, okay, what are the effects of having copper or zinc ions uh, along those chains? And we could show that even though we're at dilute ion concentration, so these would never even show up if you made a crystal and you may get a still different structure at higher concentration. Their, their effects of where you put those uh, metal ions in on the uh, peptides. And then there's a second piece in the 17 to 42 part of the sequence, and they were able to figure out, you know, using again combinations of different modalities, that it actually uh, sits nestled in a fold of the amyloid. And so, uh, yeah, anyway, very beautiful piece of work that we haven't, I don't think we've published this yet. I think I have a manuscript in my queue. Anyway, so uh, they figured out the second site, and so the copper toxicity people went pretty crazy over that, that, oh, wait a second, you know, our modeling's all wrong, and, you know, this is, this is where the atoms are, and then you can do a more uh, uh, useful prediction of the related chemistry. And so what we don't know in particular is where water molecules are here, and then, you know, what, uh, you know, how disruptive is this uh, versus no. And yeah, we're just about out of time. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is kind of what our microscopes look like. And the neat thing is you can turn on the different modalities contextually to pull out the information you want, and you can also do that as a function of position. So if you're missing something, you just drive the microscope, bless you, over to where you need it. The bad news that I didn't share is these piezos have what's called hysteresis. So you tell it to go somewhere, it keeps going for a while. And since the ceramics, there is a way around that that no one has ever taken on, and that is you use crystalline piezos like lithium nibate, but your gains go down. It goes back to the question, how big an area can you look at? Your gains go down a factor of three or four, but very doable. And so if we really got to the point where, okay, we need to constrain between this structure and that structure, I need microwaves and local barrier height in these three positions. We could, in principle, do that, but nobody does it currently. Uh, and so part of that would be needing the real-time analyses, which we're pretty close now, right? We've not used to advantage sparsity in data acquisition. We've just used it in the analyses. But uh, one of the ideas that came out of the Keck Center is to program, you know, all the analyses in FPGAs, and that'll accelerate them further. And then while the sample's right there, you could go and measure it. In the first case, you know, two years, you can never do that. Ten minutes, you're starting to get into, you could do that, and you, a little more acceleration, and you'd be in good shape. So, you know, we're particularly interested in dynamics, and I showed you, you know, the STM's really slow as the AFM. So you have to come up with smarter ways to do uh, dynamics. You want to look at rare events. Right? This is the only time there's ever been snow on the ground on the UCLA campus. It was a while ago. It's not going to happen any time this week. Uh, but uh, you want to be able to find those rare events, and you're capable of it because you can look for, you know, something that uh, stands out. Uh, you know, the, one of the neat things about that collaboration was Stan and Andrea and their postdocs were all competing with each other for algorithm efficiencies, and so we just ran them side by side as races all the time. Uh, uh, you know, as I said. 
we'll get at some point to contextual acquisition, I think. And uh, Sergey Kalanen, I think, will have some strong thoughts on that. He ran a functional microscopy group at Oak Ridge, and then I don't know what happened there, but he uh, switched over to Tennessee, and now he's on sabbatical at Amazon. And I've tried to hire him since he was a second year grad student. So if anyone's on a search committee, he'd be good to get. And then Kevin will be back. So he ran the microwave STM in our group, and he did that first early experiment with uh, picking up the C60 molecule. And I know he did the single pixel camera stuff with Stan. So I uh, tried to put everyone's name on every slide. Collaborators around the world, and then, you know, especially CAC, NSF, and DOE uh, help pay for this. And hopefully, I got my uh, collaborators here for this stuff. And I'm really looking forward to the next five plus weeks of, uh, of interactions here. So, thanks so much.